Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, wonderful to be here. This is my, I think, third time in uh, Bangalore total, if I remember correctly. But I think the first time was back in 2023, and then 2019, and then this time. And I um, haven't been back to India since COVID, so I took this opportunity to visit my family who lives in Mumbai and also Delhi, so it's fantastic to be back. And I have a fun talk which is focused on basically how the space program where I spent the bulk of my career um, leads to a sustainability mindset. Um, and ultimately something really important with climate change as we're seeing today. And this fun graphic, um, I actually had made like a set of artwork for this thing that I did with USC. Um, so it's meant to be Mars, there's the TARDIS for anybody who's a Doctor Who, there's a, uh, a Star Trek um, shuttle for anybody who's a Star Trek fan, because I'm a massive science fiction fan. And that one is actually supposed to be me um, outside of a Mars base that we are working on. But I have two jobs. Everybody in the startup space knows you probably have more than one job. So I have my founder CEO role of my startup hydroplane, and then I'm also a professor at the University of Southern California. But I definitely spend more than 100% of my time working on my startup because as everyone knows, um, it takes a lot of energy uh, to get a company off the ground um, and you know, get it to be sustainable and solvent moving forward. Uh, but um, when I talk about sort of the things that I've worked on in my career, um, I spent 16 years working for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and three years before that working for Boeing on the development of cryogenic launch vehicles. And in each one of those situations, um, it was a really complicated problem that required a sophisticated engineering solution to be able to provide you know, the performance that we were looking for. Um, and then I spent a couple of years working on my PhD research on electric propulsion systems for spacecraft. It's ironic, because now I'm doing electric propulsion systems for aircraft many years later. And then I spent several years working on entry to set landing systems for Mars, Curiosity, for landing on the surface of Venus, and then Earth reentry systems. And I had a few years stint working on an atomic physics facility um, for the International Space Station as well. But after about 17 years, I felt as though it was important for me to start doing something here on Earth, quite literally, and sort of take my engineering skills and put them into the green transportation space. Um, and so I got recruited to be, I think it might be a little loud, um, a little bit much feedback. What do you think? I'll let you take care of that. But um, I got recruited to join Virgin Hyperloop, which is, um, which was, I mean, it's not doing as well now as it was a couple of years ago, developing a form of ground transportation, which is like airline travel, but on the ground. Um, and it can go to airline speeds and even in excess of that, which was a very complex um, engineering system, which has a lot of space program-esque technologies associated with it. And then I shifted over to electric aviation, um, specifically now hydrogen fuel cell powered electric aviation. And I'm also a very active pilot, so um, part of creating a system which is decarbonized for aviation will also help you know, my pilot community in addition to the rest of the planet by helping to decarbonize emissions. But in all these situations, there is a theme of rocket science behind these different technology developments, and I'll kind of weave that into the talk um, going forward. Uh, but the space program does, however, face a lot of criticism. It faces criticism criticism in the United States, it faces criticism here with ISRO, and it faces criticism in Europe. And the argument is that there's a lot of money being spent on technologies that don't directly help solve problems going on right now. And there is some truth to that, but then there's also, that's a very short-sighted view, because when you look at all the different technologies that have come from the space program, they actually have revolutionized our society, and they've grown our economy tremendously. The obvious one, of course, is um, telecommunications industry, right? That's enabled entirely by satellites, and satellites can't get into space without launch vehicles, so once again, it all comes back to rocket science. But there is a shift now to away from government space, now into privatized commercial space, and even ISRO and even Indian government is looking at putting more money into the private sector for space exploration. And in the United States, specifically, there are several companies who are developing um, launch vehicle technologies for space tourism purposes. And so one of them that you know, takes a lot of heat is Virgin Galactic, obviously, because it's Richard Branson's um, you know, joyride for very wealthy people. Jeff Bezos has the same thing um, with the Blue Origin rocket. And then, of course, SpaceX has a mixed model of both payload launches as well as people launches to the International Space Station. But it is a good debate to be had because as a taxpayer of whatever country you may be in, your money should go towards things which are useful. So you have to think about, you know, am I making an investment in something which will have a good return on investment wherever you are, whatever sector you're in. And 
I myself have always been inspired by the space program. I think probably the greatest return on investment, at least for NASA, and I think NASA has a global reputation, is it motivates lots of young people to become engineers and scientists because they're so fascinated by the idea of you know, alien worlds, and I myself was always a massive Star Trek fan. I used to watch Star Trek original series with my dad, who was a PhD mechanical engineer, and you know, sadly my dad is no longer with us. He passed away um, over a decade ago, but I had the opportunity to do a program with uh, William Shatner, who's Captain Kirk, and so that was a lot of fun for me as an extreme Star Trek nerd, and he actually interviewed me, so it wasn't the other way around. So I was teaching him about like how you land things on the surface of Mars. But many people, myself included, find the space program inspirational because you're able to solve really difficult problems, and you're able to make brand new technologies come to life. And one of the things which, if you are a science fiction fan, is that there are so many technologies that we use today, whether it's our cell phones, started out as a flip phone, actually came from Star Trek with their communicators, whether it's tablets like our iPads, or whether it's new forms of transportation, like the Enterprise for Star Trek actually used ion drive. My PhD thesis was in ion thrusters, right? So it's kind of cool how we get inspiration from science fiction and we can turn it into reality. And as engineers, as technologists, as computer scientists, we're the ones that make that technology basically a reality. But a lot of that is driven by the space program mindset to create new and innovative things. And in the utopian genre of science fiction, it's to make a better world. But as everybody knows, um, there's more than one different type of science fiction. I'll go past that quote. Um, there's also dystopian science fiction, right, where things aren't going so well. A kind of in-between example of that would be the book, the movie, The Martian, where this person was left behind. They thought he was dead, but he was able to use his science and engineering skills to survive. So um, I think that is absolutely the case for COVID, right, with the development, rapid, rapid development of mRNA vaccines. We were able to science our way out of that problem relatively rapidly. And, and I think now more than ever, as the challenges grow for climate, as the challenges grow for a growing population, we will need more scientific solutions to solve unique challenges that happen here at home. And when we go full on dystopian sci-fi, such as Blade Runner 2049, this is a futuristic Los Angeles where essentially all plant life and animal life is dead, the air quality is terrible, and it's really not a nice place to live. And, and you know, if we don't do something about our CO2 emissions, this is the direction that we're headed. And you, you obviously live in a big urban environment here in, in, in Bengaluru, same thing in Mumbai, same thing in Los Angeles where I live. Um, and the air quality is getting worse, and that has not only implications to changes to the environment, the weather, but it also has implications to human health, right? So whether we're feeling it as individual or whether we're feeling it as a society with loss of crops, drought, flooding, it's a big deal. So even my own house where I live in Los Angeles on a hill experienced a mudslide because of the change in climate that exists even on the west coast of the United States. So it is a real thing. Um, and we always have to think about the environmental cost of what we do in our personal lives as well as in our professional lives and in our businesses. And then I'll take that back to the space program because one of the primary motivations of NASA, of ESA, of ISRO is to actually explore the universe. It's formation, as well as explore our solar system and how it evolved. And so the terrestrial planets that you see here, Earth in the middle, Mars on the right, and Venus on the left, Venus is one planet in from us towards the sun, and Mars is one planet out from us. When the solar system first formed, these planets actually had water on the surface, and they had a more comfortable environment, but over the course of the past four and a half billion years, um, thank goodness Earth is still a nice place, Mars' atmosphere has been ripped away, so it has primarily CO2, 1% of the surface density of what we have here on Earth, a really strong radiation environment. Venus, on the other hand, experienced a runaway greenhouse gas effect, where all of its oceans boiled, um, then basically created um, a massive thick layer of clouds, and now the heat can't escape. So the surface temperature on Venus is 470 degrees centigrade, that's incredibly hot, and the surface pressure is 100 atmospheres. And one of the primary reasons why NASA is investing in missions to go back to Venus is because they think that Venus represents a great, um, great is a bad word, um, but a representative example of climate change um, at the planetary scale. So if we can understand what happened on Venus, hopefully we can understand more about um, climate 
shifting on the planetary scale so that we can prevent that happening here on Earth, right? So, and we were talking about this last night at dinner, but the ocean actually is a sink for carbon dioxide. It's saturated now, which means as the temperature of the Earth rises, that CO2 comes out of the ocean and further exacerbates um, climate change and global warming. So this is a real thing with its origins in terms of scientific understanding, modeling, and interest that comes from the space program. So when we come back down to Earth, I like to focus now on transportation because that's the sector that I'm in. Um, there are CO2 emissions from a variety of different sectors, but the transport sector represents roughly 22 to 20 percent, um, 27 percent of greenhouse gas emissions and CO2 emissions. When you look at the transportation sector as just by itself, 40 percent of those emissions come from passenger cars, but then the remaining 60 percent come from heavy duty use vehicles like buses, trucks, aircraft, marine sector, and rail. So we have to decarbonize not just individual passenger cars, we have to decarbonize all forms of transport. And then when you look at the CO2 emissions um, from different modes of transport in terms of CO2 emitted per passenger kilometer, what's interesting here is that the long haul international flight, because it's flown at capacity, every seat is filled, actually has a relatively low CO2 per passenger kilometer as compared to the domestic regional flight as compared to driving, driving around in your car. That's because mass transit is a more efficient way of getting around. So the takeaway from this, of course, is not that everybody should be flying everywhere, but the takeaway should be that more mass transportation, more shared transit is the way that we can reduce CO2 emissions more effectively, basically, which means going away from passenger cars which is good, because who likes traffic? I live in LA, tons of traffic too. Um, but it's important for us to understand these numbers. But there is a bad additional negative thing associated with aviation, and that's that it also produces NOx emissions. And when you release those NOx emissions in the upper atmosphere, it has even more of an effect on radiative heating. So it actually exacerbates climate change further. But at least you can see how everything um, is spayed out here in terms of transportation. And then the other trend, which I like from this graph here, is that the red trend is CO2 emissions from the aviation sector, right? More airplanes are being bought, bought, more people are flying. The blue line is emissions from the ground transport sector. That's because ground transport is easier to decarbonize because you can use batteries or you can use a catenary, you know, running electricity off the grid for rail systems. So, you know, getting rid of passenger cars or making them purely battery powered or shifting over to mass transit with metro, light rail, subways is a way that you can decarbonize the ground sector. But what that means is that in 2050, aviation will actually be the primary source of CO2 emissions if we don't do something to decarbonize it. So we have to think about technologies that have an evolutionary path to get us to where we want to go. So when, as an engineer and as a systems engineer as I was for many years at NASA JPL, we're always having to reinvent ourselves and we also have to reinvent transportation. But as an engineer, you don't just make things up on the fly, you kind of figure out what your customer wants. And so the customer for a transportation system is obviously you, the end user, as well as the government that probably puts a lot of money into investing in it. So you come up with some pretty obvious requirements, like whether you're a software developer or a hardware engineer, you want requirements to work to. And for transportation, those of course are safety, accessibility, interoperability, environmental impact, and cost, right? If something is too expensive, that means everybody isn't using it, and you're not solving the mass transportation system. But if you always keep this in mind, understanding what your top level requirements are, then you can come up with a better solution, I would argue. So uh, the first thing I like to talk about with regards to space program-ish technologies is the Hyperloop. So there was a lot of interest in the Hyperloop, I would say, you know, about five to eight years ago in India, there was a project being planned in Mumbai to connect Mumbai to Pune, um, um, which of course I don't think it is going to happen for a variety of reasons because it's very expensive, so probably the government didn't want to put the money in, hence the cost piece of the equation has to be affordable for someone to pay for it. But the principle of operation of the Hyperloop is basically a maglev train, which already exists, but putting it inside of a vacuum tube. So basically simulating the space environment, removing all the air from around the vehicle, than eliminating aerodynamic drag. So that concept is basically leveraging how would one do things in the, with a spacecraft, which is you're cruising at speed because you have no aerodynamic drag and that's a super efficient way of running. So um, although it's not happening right now, we did build one 
So um, when I worked for the startup that I worked at, uh, we actually built a subscale Hyperloop, which could fit people. So it wasn't subscale as in you know, a mouse Hyperloop. Um, it was a people-sized Hyperloop, but it only went for you know, just under a kilometer. So it was a proof of concept demonstration, which would have to be extended over you know, 50, 100, 1,000 kilometers to make it a useful system for actual implementation. But what's so interesting, and this was also kind of a topic of dinner conversation last night, is that this space, which is trying to reinvent ground-based mass transport, is not being done by the big um, traditional infrastructure and companies that work on rail technologies. It is being done by the startup space exclusively. Because one of the real ways that you can disrupt any sector is you go away from the traditional big companies and you go into the startup space. And the startup space can be more agile, can be more efficient, can be more able to take risk, right? Because you're not yet a publicly traded company. So there's so many reasons why the startup space is a fantastic place to develop new technologies and to implement them because of that high risk posture, which is acceptable because you're not yet publicly traded. And so there's Hyperloop company in India, there's one in Canada, there's two in the US, there's one in the Netherlands, there's probably a few more. Actually, there's one in Switzerland as well. So there are several companies in this ecosystem who are still looking for more funding because it is a very expensive endeavor. I used to think the space program is expensive. The space program is cheap compared to ground-based infrastructure projects. That's actually the most expensive is, is ground-based infrastructure because you're talking about land acquisition, rights of way, um, leveling services, doing tunneling, things like that are quite expensive. But the point is, though, is a lot of these technologies have been taken to a pretty good level from a prototype perspective thanks to the startup ecosystem and thanks to the capital that went into developing these technologies. And a lot of that capital came from not the United States, but a lot of that capital has come from the Middle East because the Middle East has a more long-term investment view when it puts in sort of like a venture capital uh, into companies. They're not trying to get a return really quickly. In a hardware-oriented transportation company, you're probably not going to get a return in like a year or two years. It's going to be a little bit longer time horizon as a result. But when we talk about um, decarbonizing transportation, we're really talking about how we're creating our energy and how we're storing our energy. And once again, I go back to the space program, right? Every single spacecraft out there produces its energy, assuming it's not going all the way out to Pluto, using solar panels, solar arrays, solar photovoltaics, the photoelectric effect, right? And so that development of that technology, which has been honed, optimized for space applications, both because of the radiation environment and because of the need to be as mass efficient and as volume efficient as you can be, has gotten its way back to Earth to create better solar panels for us to use here on Earth. And in um, Los Angeles, where I live, which is in the southwestern United States, tremendous amount of sun, there's a huge amount of electricity which is now produced by renewables from both solar and wind. I think it's cl pretty close to 40% now, so that's a significant chunk. And everybody knows Americans use far too much energy, so the fact that we're able to produce 40% of it goes to show that it is a completely, um, uh, an excellent solution and a cost-effective solution because electricity is cheaper when you look at it per unit energy cost than gasoline is. So that's why electricity is a great way to go in future, even just from an economies of scale perspective. But when we talk about energy production, we talk about solar, we talk about wind, geothermal, potentially nuclear. But when we talk about storage, because you can't always feed directly off of a solar panel if you're in a moving vehicle, we're talking about batteries, which right now the best technology out there is lithium ion, and also hydrogen fuel cells, which has its origins, guess what, in the space program. I'll talk about more as the presentation goes on. There is also the ability to potentially put solar panels on your vehicle, but that's kind of limiting because you're not always going to get sun, and you have to have a large surface area to facilitate that. And you also can have hybrid electric systems where you're still using gasoline, right, but you're using it in a hybrid sense with regenerative braking. But that isn't a truly emission-free solution, but it's a stepping stone that we've seen used in the automotive space, for example. Um, but these are basically the solutions that we have, the little triangle of getting our ourselves away from direct combustion with hydrocarbons over to something which is a lot more efficient, uh, which is with um, either energy storage in the form of batteries or energy storage in the form of hydrogen. And another great space-derived technology is solar concentrator facilities. So this is a research facility that we have in the desert in Los Angeles, close to where my company operates, where you have mirrors which concentrate um, basically the sunlight onto them, then focus it back onto a column of salts which become molten, which then get hot, then expand, 
turn a turbine and generate electricity. And so these are more efficient per unit area. So there are many places in the world where they don't have enough land mass to be able to have massive solar array farms. And so this is a way where you can produce the same amount of energy, but with a smaller area. And these mirrors are actually actuated um, using I mean, maybe artificial intelligence is too strong of a word, but they're actively actuated to maximize their, you know, sun angles so that you can get maximum output from them. Otherwise, you wouldn't get as much energy. So a really smart system which is being demoed, but we also have larger facilities without that actuation in both California and Nevada. And they're kind of impressive because you can fly over them and it kind of looks like this alien Dyson Sphere facility, but it's not. It's actually human developed. <laughs> but I think the most uh, sensible solution moving forward is to utilize our most renewable resource, and that is hydrogen. So hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. It's also the element which powers our sun, which then gives us our nuclear reaction, which gives us our radiation, which keeps our planet warm and keeps our cycle going. Um, but using that energy from the sun, which ultimately does come from hydrogen, um, is the way that we already do get all the energy here on Earth with regards to the growing of plants and how we actually have weather that we can survive in here. And um, how does one make hydrogen? I'll talk about the different ways that you can make it from other substances, but the most clean way to make it is born in the name of hydrogen. So hydrogen actually means water genesis in Greek. So hydrogen um, plus oxygen makes water. If you have water, you can apply electricity to it in a process called electrolysis to break up the water, and then you create hydrogen and you create oxygen. So the green way to make hydrogen is to take water, which is an abundant resource. It can be gray water, it can be sea water, as long as it's cleaned and distilled, and then use that to create hydrogen, and that hydrogen can then be your energy carrier for hydrogen fuel cell technology or even hydrogen combustion or however you, you want to use the hydrogen. But hydrogen fuel cell technology, which I'll talk about in more detail later as to how it works, was actually developed by the space program. So it is an alternative to a battery, is a much more energy dense, uh, power dense system than the battery. And it was developed for the Apollo program for energy storage. And it was also developed even further and used again for the space shuttle for energy storage. And NASA is interested in it for um, different technologies such as power generation on the surface of the moon for a future lunar colony, power generation on the surface of Mars for a future Mars colony, and then even for transport applications such as rovers and airplanes uh, to be used on Mars. So Mars does have a little bit of an atmosphere. You can have an airplane, although it's not air, it's CO2 that you're using as a fluid medium. So once again, development in the space program, tremendous ROI because now it is in our commercial sector. So this is my car. This is a hydrogen fuel cell car. It is a commercially available product. There's three different car models that you can buy in the United States. Right now, you can only buy them in California because we're the only state that has hydrogen infrastructure. But it is cheaper than a Tesla, around the same price as a four-door sedan. Um, and it, it is fueled by hydrogen, not hydrogen combustion, but hydrogen fuel cell technology. So this addresses a portion of the passenger car market in terms of CO2 emissions, but this obviously doesn't address larger vehicles such as buses, trucks, planes, marine, and rail. But the point is, is this technology developed in the space program has now been leveraged in a very affordable way for the passenger car market um, in the United States. And it's developed by Japan and Korea, um, and even China also has a, a company that's developing it. And so these technologies can now now be used commercially. So once again, the return on investment from the space program, I think, is quite clear um, in this regard. And what's so nice about fuel cell technology is that unlike lithium ion batteries, where lithium is a non-renewable resource, it has to be mined, um, hydrogen is not. It is a renewable resource. It is present in the form of chemically bonded water, for example. So when we talk about different types of hydrogen, we're talking about how it's created. And so green hydrogen, meaning sustainable hydrogen, is produced by a renewable electricity into an electrolyzer to create hydrogen, which is then stored. It can be stored in a liquid form, or it can be stored in a gaseous form. It's more efficient to store it in a liquid form um, in terms of you know, transporting around because you can carry more of it. And then it is used by end users, whether that's the chemical industry, which is the primary user right now, um, or shipping, or aviation, or ground transport. So this is the ecosystem, and the goal in many countries, including India, because I think the Prime Minister of India recently put out a hydrogen policy, including Europe, the EU has, and including the United States with the Biden administration, is to invest more in the production of green hydrogen, which then is also synergistic with producing more green electricity, meaning solar, wind, geothermal. So it's a really nice cycle. 
that you create more green energy, which is then used to create hydrogen, and also can be used for direct electricity to charge lithium-ion battery-powered cars, as well as for electricity for your homes and your businesses. So it's all a nice ecosystem in that sense, right? So you can eliminate hydrocarbons altogether in that scenario. So this is important because people oftentimes will say, oh, but hydrogen is actually very dirty. And they're true in the sense that currently, globally, most hydrogen is produced as gray hydrogen. And gray hydrogen is basically, you take a hydrocarbon, you reform it, you create hydrogen, and that means you put out CO2. So that's the cheapest way to get hydrogen right now, but it's dirty, it's not clean. So everybody wants to go away from that, and there's tremendous investments being made globally to create more green hydrogen. But what does that mean right now? green hydrogen is more expensive per kilogram than gray hydrogen. But in California, where we have fuel cell vehicles, we pretty much only have green hydrogen at the pump. So the goal there was to make a shift over to that model pretty quickly. Um, and so in that sense, it can be done. And when you run the numbers of the cost per mile of a hydrocarbon powered car versus a green hydrogen powered car, they're actually the same now because of the efficiency of the fuel cell. So as the price of green hydrogen drops, as it will because of the government investments, then it will become cheaper to operate your vehicle um, on green hydrogen versus um, hydrocarbons, which is great. good for the environment, good for business in that sense. So. I will once again go back to my argument of the space program as inspiration for everything. Guess what is the most energy efficient form of propellant and oxidizer for launch vehicles, for the rocket application? Liquid oxygen as the oxidizer and liquid hydrogen as the fuel. So the space program are the people who develop the use of hydrogen and oxygen cryogenically for the purpose of um, generating a tremendous amount of thrust to be able to get out of Earth's gravity well. And so the reason is pretty simple. If you look at this bar chart, jet A means jet fuel means hydrocarbon. Um, hydrogen is hydrogen. It is three times as energy dense. That's significant. When you normally talk about performance improvements, you're talking about you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 percent, three times as energy dense, right? So energy per unit mass, per unit kilogram. That's the reason why it is the propellant of choice, if you can do it, it's more complicated, for launch vehicles. And we'll talk about that more at the end of the presentation. So that's the argument for it from an efficiency perspective. And there's a lot of other arguments for it as well. You know, when you combust hydrogen, you're producing water. When you use it electrochemically, you're also producing water. So it's emission-free from a carbon perspective. And you can also produce it locally. So you could produce it at your airport. You could produce it someplace where you have enough space to have a solar panel field and put the excess electricity into an electrolyzer. Um, and you get off of um, oil, which means you get off of foreign oil, which means that you basically take, pull the rug out from under the people who currently manipulate energy price market because they're the only providers of it, right? So if you are a country that currently does not have any oil or any re natural resources in that way, but you do have access to solar, to wind, to geothermal, you can produce your own fuel. So it's actually an incredibly powerful argument in terms of energy independence and national security. And everybody knows this, by the way, including militaries around the world, that it is a desirable solution because it takes away our dependence on other countries. And even lithium ion batteries, that lithium comes from somewhere and it probably doesn't come from your own country, right? So, you know, this is one way to truly remove that dependence and, and then, which basically helps, right? Because you never want power to be centered in one place. You want people to be, you know, more equal to each other in that regard. And then a nice thing from a business model perspective um, that I'm interested in, because that's what my company is focused on, is that when you look at passenger transport, you look at how much payload you want to carry and how far do you want to go. And right now, airplanes, buses, trucks, and sea vessels, like marine ships, all have similar needs in the payload to the um, range perspective, which means same total energy requirements. So you can conceivably develop a fuel cell technology which services that entire sector, which is what we're working on um, at my company. I will say it is a lot more difficult to develop a brand new fuel cell than it is to stick a bunch of batteries in the back of a plane, in the back of a boat, in the back of a truck. You can't put it in the back of the plane because then the plane will pitch up. Um, but it's much harder to develop this. But the easy solution is never typically the most efficient solution, right? So you usually have to have some complexity up front to develop a really fantastic efficient solution, which in the end is cheaper for your end-use customers. So you pay up front for the research and development, you get the really good product with the high efficiency um, as well as de design for good unit cost, then you have a better solution. So as JFK said, we don't do these things because they're easy, we do them because they're hard. And the same applies to developing new technologies for transport and energy storage. So now I'll show a really short video that we made for Oshkosh, which is a air show, um, and it's fun, so hopefully it plays. 
I'm a doctor in Anita Sengupta, professor of astronautics and the founder of Hyperdrive. After nearly two decades of working on complex space technologies like the Indicus and Atlantis with the Mars and Jurassic Rover and developing land propulsion for deep space exploration for NASA, I founded the Project Plan to develop advanced technologies to decarbonize aviation. At Hydroplane, a team of expert engineers and scientists is solving this problem by developing and building a 200 kilowatt hydrogen fuel cell power plant for the aviation industry. Hydroplane's innovative approach of stacked modular fuel cells allows for easily scalable solutions from single engine aircraft to helicopters, eVTOL platforms, and regional aircraft. In our agile workflow, we use off-the-shelf components where possible and develop new technologies and systems where necessary. Our novel approach will lead to significant improvement in efficiency and a substantial weight reduction, making us an emission-free alternative to piston and turbine engine power plants for aviation. Hydroplane's innovative fuel cell power plant will provide over 300 miles of range with no charge time, no battery replacements, a low noise profile while only emitting water. You can be part of a cleaner future. Join us as Hydroplane develops the world's first single-engine aircraft hydrogen fuel cell power plant. We had a lot of fun making that movie, <laughs> but we're located in the, uh, the desert um, just north of Los Angeles, but it's still Los Angeles County, so we've got lots of nice wide open spaces to do our flight tests um, coming up later this year. But ultimately, hydrogen fuel cell electric propulsion is just electric propulsion. You have electricity that you're producing from the fuel cell, and then you're putting that into an electric motor to either turn a shaft for a ground-based vehicle application or to turn a propeller for a marine or for an aircraft application. And then the other benefit, does anybody have an electric vehicle um, in the room? I know they're not as ubiquitous here as they are in Los Angeles and Southern California, but they also are incredibly quiet. So you actually have to have an intentional noise which is made by your vehicle when you're reversing so you don't like freak people out or accidentally, you know, they run into you. Um, and they have really low maintenance costs. So cost, your cost is way lower for an electric or a hydrocarbon. And then if you're operator, your operations cost will be a lot lower too because you're using much less fuel because of the efficiency of the hydrogen as well as the efficiency of the fuel cell, which is an electrochemical process. And then I won't belabor this point, um, but the point is there is a evolutionary use case, right? You're not going to start off with flying a, a Boeing, you know, a 767 on a fuel cell, but you're going to start off with a smaller plane, which is what we're working on. Um, and then you'll work your way up with bigger and bigger systems because every time you do a new product iteration, you improve efficiency, right? And so then you can translate that efficiency into operating at lower, higher power levels and lower heat dissipation. So whether you're in the software space or in the hardware space, you can still use that multiple um, iterations of design to generate new products which are at higher power levels for us, in our case, um, and higher efficiencies going forward. And the real argument behind it, just so you understand why it's so powerful, is that this is a plot of volumetric density, so energy per unit volume, and gravimetric density, energy per unit mass. Um, I'm sorry, this is power, uh, not energy. And lithium ion battery is the worst. So when it comes from the density perspective, lithium ion battery is the worst solution. Gasoline is kind of up there in the middle, so it's a good one. Diesel up there is a good one. Hydrogen is great from the mass perspective, terrible from the volume perspective, so you have to store it as a liquid or as a high pressure gas. So that's the challenge for hydrogen is how you store it, but even that is something which has been mitigated for launch vehicle space applications um, and mitigated for ground use applications, for example, in my car. And the advantage is if you need more energy because you're going to fly or drive for a really long time, you get up to 10x the benefit using a hydrogen fuel cell technology versus a lithium ion battery where you're just adding more batteries, so you never get any improvement efficiency. So you really start to see the benefits for larger vehicles, heavier payloads, and longer total um, endurance that's required for your application. So um, I already talked about these points, but I know most of us who fly think about flying in, you know, like a 200-seat aircraft or a 100-seat aircraft or a 400-seat aircraft. We don't think about flying in smaller aircraft. So I fly in smaller aircraft all the time because that's part of what I do for my job and part of what I do in my um, Civil Air Patrol role. But you actually can have smaller aircraft to serve a regional transit use case. You just would have fewer people on board the aircraft. And that's already being proposed for urban air mobility. I worked in that space quite a bit. And it has tremendous use cases for medevac, um, other government humanitarian aid disaster use cases, flight training, helicopters, right? There are many different smaller aircrafts. And ironically, you can take it up to regional transport. And when you look at CO2 output from 
the aviation sector, on the graph I showed you earlier, regional transport has the most CO2 because people are flying much older propeller-driven aircraft um, that are not as efficient. So they're actually putting out more CO2 per passenger kilometer. So the really big jets have been optimized, which is great. So the CO2 per passenger kilometer is a lot less. So we're not trying to solve that problem. We're trying to solve the regional market on down problem. And all the other synergistic use cases with marine and you know, heavy duty vehicles. So how does a fuel cell work? This is the science part of the presentation. Um, it is a passive device. It is a low temperature device. It has no moving parts. All the engineers in the room should be like, oh, that sounds good, right? That means it's gonna last a really long time. Combustion, high temperatures, um, and high pressures, as well as high RPMs, meaning lots of wear mechanisms. But hydrogen gas is brought in through the anode. This is a single cell configuration. You stack the cells together for a fuel cell. The hydrogen gas is disassociated um, with a catalyst. It releases electrons. Those electrons are your electricity. On the other side of the fuel cell, on the cathode, you bring in air. It's an air breathing system. And then you disassociate the oxygen. Um, oxygen ions combine with hydrogen ions that pass through an electrolyte, um, very different electrolyte from what you have in a battery. Um, and that forms water. And then water is exhausted from the system as liquid because it's a low temperature device. Um, so it is very simple in that sense. But you can imagine there's lots of complexity in the design of the individual piece parts that go inside of the fuel cell. And then you also have to design, a, you know, somewhat sophisticated thermal management system to handle the heat load. But the point is it doesn't have moving parts and it's low temperature, which means it can last for a really long time, which then ends up being great as a owner operator of a vehicle who doesn't have to service their engine every couple of you know, months. Or in the case of an aircraft, you actually have to remove it and replace it per the FAA requirements. Um, so our product that we're developing is actually a power plant for inside of a single engine aircraft. It's custom, everything from the fuel cell stack to the balance of plant, and it does fit within the existing compartment. And this is significantly smaller, um, but higher power than the automotive the systems that exist on the market, which is the reason why we can use it for buses and trucks as well, we think. Um, now, in terms of what I think is really exciting about this space, because I'm also a professor, is that in the past, if you were an automotive engineer, or you were an aviation engineer, or you were an automotive technician, or an aircraft maintenance technician, you're only dealing with combustion systems. So this is going to generate an entire new set of skills which are required for these disciplines, as well as new jobs. So there is tremendous economic opportunity by shifting our energy economy away from traditional combustion systems into this new area. So anytime you implement these new technologies, it ends up actually being good for everybody's business. And we are currently working with lots of young people because we can train them directly on how to service, maintain, and design fuel cell technology. So we do have a lot of students. Um, interns, most of them are graduate students, but we do have a few undergrad students, and lots of young people right out of school working for the company because they are a better fit than somebody who's entrenched in the way things have always been done in the combustion-powered portions of the world. So this is the startup life that we're all living, but I think we're having a good time. Um, and we are planning for our first flight demonstration a little bit later on this year in our Piper aircraft um, in Los Angeles, desert region, which is where we're at. Um, and Really great thing as well is that this aircraft will be flown in exactly the same way as a combustion-powered aircraft. The pilot won't feel any difference. I will eventually, I won't be the first pilot because my investors don't want me to be, but I'll fly it in future. I already flew this plane from Texas to over to LA. Um, and it really is the same experience, just like if you have a battery-powered car. So once again, easier to adopt because the customer will be comfortable with it. But I'm sure in your space, in the software world, you think about what's important to your customer. Our customer cares about lower cost, higher durability, lower weight. Those are the performance metrics. I don't know if it'll work if I click on it, but this is not that interesting, but I'll play it anyway in case it works. Um, yes, so um, what it makes a hydrogen fuel cell that's developed um, using a low temperature PEM technology, polymer exchange membrane, is the membrane. So the membrane is the electrolyte. And the membrane is basically like a piece of plastic wrap that you put over your food. Um, and because of the chemical structure of the membrane, it allows the transport of hydrogen ions through it. And the more efficient that membrane is in the transport of ions, the better the electrochemical efficiency. So for our system, we have a custom membrane that I'm showing you being baked literally in an oven here. Um, and that gives us significantly higher um, basically power density versus current density um, than what is currently available um, from the uh, you know, automotive sector. And so this is the membrane. This is an example of what goes inside the heart of a fuel cell in addition to the metallic plates. So it is kind of simple, but it's also a little bit complex, right? Because you can imagine there's a lot of development that goes into making that membrane. That is a single cell. You stack those single cells together to get you to a fuel cell stack to the power levels that you want. Um, so 
The last place that I wanted to talk about, because it is very much becoming a realistic form of transport now, is spaceflight. And spaceflight is um, being done all across the world. I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of emphasis in commercial spaceflight. So any of you who have an Amazon Prime membership are funding this development. <laughs> so Jeff Bezos, I believe, created Amazon so he could become very wealthy to start Blue Origin. And so Blue Origin is developing a suborbital vehicle that you see going off here, which is doing, you know, very rich people flights, uh, so you can see Earth from a little bit higher up. Um, but they're developing another vehicle, um, which will give you sub, which will give you orbital transportation capability. Because ultimately, I think he wants to like manufacture stuff in space off of Earth to reduce the CO2 footprint of manufacturing. You can debate whether that's a good thing or not, um, but that's for maybe Q and A. But in this scenario, however, Blue Origin is using liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. So if that liquid hydrogen was produced by electrolysis, which it currently isn't, but if it was, this actually would be an emission form of suborbital transport and an emission, a carbon emission free form of suborbital transport and then eventually a carbon emission free form of orbital transport. Now there is a catch, unfortunately, which people are only starting to think about now, is that when you combust hydrogen, this is not an electrochemical process, this is a traditional chemical combustion process, the temperatures are quite high, and when you have high temperatures and you combine it with nitrogen in the atmosphere, you form nitrous oxides, which are called NOx emissions. Those, unfortunately, are greenhouse gases. So you're not greenhouse gas emission free, but you are a lot less uh, CO2 emission free than using like a methane or something like that. Or the Virgin Galactic situation, which is really nasty because it burns a rubber, so it's toxic and has CO2 associated with it. So this is a better solution for um, efficiency, right, um, as well as for putting out carbon emissions. But you will still have NOx emissions when you combust hydrogen. And the combustion process um, is not an efficient process because a lot of the energy is lost in heat. Right, and so in most cases, you want it translated to mechanical energy, not the heat, but you lose a huge amount in heat, which is why fuel cells are great, because you're not losing that much energy in heat, because you're operating at a relatively low temperature. Another example of hydrogen-powered space flight um, is the Boeing vehicle. Um, so this is the Starliner. It's going to get people back and forth. The space station um, is not quite right there yet. They've done a few flight tests and have had some challenges on the software side, <laughs> if you can believe it, not on the hardware side. Um, I, I don't know what the issue had. I didn't follow it closely enough, but they did have issues where they weren't able to get to the correct orbit um, just because of their, their software control related to it. And then um, the final area, which I think will be the number one competitor to SpaceX moving forward, is the Indian launch vehicle development. So currently, they are using liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen for the upper stage. They obviously are getting bigger and bigger and bigger to a heavy lift capability. And because of the cost efficiency of the Indian launch vehicle program, just like with the Mars Orbiter mission, um, it will be more cost competitive with SpaceX. So I think they do have an interest to develop a commercial arm. I think they do. I was over at ISRO yesterday giving this talk, actually. Um, and uh, and I think this is a tremendous opportunity for India just because it can be like a huge player in the um, commercial space sector launching people's payloads. And I don't know for sure um, if they're going to shift over to LOX hydrogen for the common booster core, but hopefully they do uh, moving forward. Um, now, this is away from transportation, but it is back towards being more sustainable. So for all of uh, any future colony on the surface of Mars, for example, this is an artist's conception of that, um, you're not going to be bringing animals with you, right? So everybody is going to be vegetarians. And one of the ways that we can all make a big impact on our carbon footprint is to be vegetarians. Because from the agriculture sector, um, animal farming has a huge CO2 output, and it's because of the efficiency. The animal eats the plant, and then you eat the animal, so you have all these inefficiencies of the, you know, the digestive process. <laughs> so if you can go closer to eating the actual plant, you get closer to the sun, you're more efficient. So even this goal to you know, grow food in space, grow food um, on the surface of Mars, um, to be able to support you know, human life on the surface of Mars and maybe other life in future, um, you know, it, that really is a vegetarian diet. And there's a lot of technology being developed now and demonstrated on the International Space Station to grow plants. Um, in a microgravity environment. So this is the veggie experiment, which is already up on space station where they grow lettuces and they eat the lettuce. The bad news is that when you don't have a gravity vector, the poor plant doesn't know which way to grow, so it's kind of a bad plant, um, right? So it knows where the light is, but it doesn't know where gravity is, so it kind of just grows in all which direction. The good news, of course, is on the surface of the Mars, you do have gravity, so the plant will obviously you know, know which direction to grow. But this suggests that um, because uh, lettuces don't grow well in microgravity, 
people probably wouldn't grow well either, so that may not be a good place to, to, to conceive children. Um, now, another great thing, um, like I think this is my second to last one, see I'm doing on time, um, is electric vehicles. So electric vehicles are nothing new to the space program, right? The lunar buggy that the Apollo astronauts drove around was an electric vehicle. Um, all of the Mars rovers since the 1990s um, up until the mid-2000s were always driven around on batteries with solar panels. Of course, more recently, um, we've um, developed a, with a RTG or an AS, RTG, basically a radioisotope thermal electric generator where you're generating heat, which you're converting to electricity, and then running electric motors, but it's still an electric vehicle for the rovers that exist today. So, and even autonomy has existed in these electric vehicles, right? Because you don't have somebody driving them with a joystick. It's all done um, via um, giving it a set of commands, and it does its own hazard sensing in terms of is there an obstacle that I shouldn't hit or a cliff that I shouldn't drive off of. So that autonomy has also been developed for the space program, which I think we're leveraging a lot of that um, in today for our autonomous driving vehicles. We can argue whether or not that is a useful thing or not. And this is one that's being developed over at NASA Johnson that we were messing around in. So this would be for you know a future Mars or lunar exploration program. Of course, you would either be in a spacesuit or you would have a pressurized capsule over you, you couldn't be out there, out in the open. Um, but lots of technology development underway in this space for space program applications, which definitely has uh, leverages for uh, applications here on Earth. And so I think the sustainability mindset can actually be really nicely coupled to this term that we've used for years in the space program, which is in situ resource utilization, ISRU, which basically means living off the land, right? Being sustainable, um, being self-sustainable. And so you can do that with power generation. So future Mars colony will have a whole series of solar panels to generate power. We clearly can do that here on Earth as well. Uh, radiation protection, thank goodness on Earth we've got a um, nice strong magnetic field which keeps out the in-space radiation and a thick atmosphere. On Mars, they don't have that, which means that you would have to um, either create um, a structure which is radiation proof or you would go subterranean or you would build structures using Martian soil which would protect you from the radiation. And that's actually the most efficient way to do it. And even the Apollo astronauts filled sandbags filled with Marsh, uh, lunar regolith to be able to protect them from the radiation from the sun. Another one is water. So we do know that there is water frozen in the subsurface of Mars that can be extracted and then electrolyzed to create liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen for uh, propulsion off of the surface. Methane is, I'm probably going to remove this from the slide just because um, it's not a good solution for Earth, um, but you can produce methane because there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere on, um, on Mars. And then extremophiles, which are plants which take in Martian CO2 and produce oxygen, which obviously people um, need to breathe. So these are ways that the space program thinks about being super sustainable because of the limitations of you know, not being able to go to the store <laughs> to buy your stuff. Um, and so I think if we adopt that mindset, that will even help us here on Earth. And ultimately, because of solar power, because of wind power, because of green hydrogen, we actually can have green technologies to connect our solar system, which is really interesting because you don't normally associate the space program with being green, but I hope today I walked you through some examples of how the technology that the space program has developed really is helping us be more sustainable today. And so we see the future in terms of my company in the marine sector, ground transport, as well as space applications. And of course, we're starting off with aircraft applications because that is the genesis of the company. Um, but ultimately, um, yeah, I actually think we have many solutions to solve our problems, not just one. And I actually think they're great solutions which will be good for the economy, create jobs, and stimulate even more investment. So I think if we have time for questions, I can take questions. Thank you. Are we doing questions or? Somebody must have one question. <laughs> There's one. I don't have a question, but I definitely want to talk about how amazing this talk has been. It's been so insi insightful. Like, we hear about a lot of things, but we can't put the, you know, things in place. But amazing storytelling, I must say. And the way you have built up the story, related it to so many things that we could relate to from the transportation uh, space and then the green technology. I think that's really amazing. So thank you so much oh. for the great session. Thank, <laughs> thank you for that. So fascinating to hear uh, your uh, stories. It's, it's opened up a whole new world for me, hydrogen powered cells. I'm curious to know, you spoke about regional transport. So how do you see the future, for example, say a travel between LA and San Diego on uh, 
an aircraft, hydroplane aircraft. How do you see that as a future? Oh, well, so right now, ironically, um, there is no good way to get between LA and San Diego other than driving. There is a train, and it's like incredibly slow because you have to stop and change to another train. So if you actually Im created a hydrogen-powered uh, aircraft network, you would be providing a service to people that they currently don't have. And one of the things we want to do is connect people who are in the desert regions to these other locations, because right now it's so hard for them to get anywhere and they have to drive their cars. So it's almost like uh, ripe for the picking because it doesn't exist. And um, people, I guess, aren't as familiar with flying in small planes if they're not in island locations. So if you live in an island location, flying in small planes is completely normal. But in general, most people just don't have that experience because they only go on the south West or the indigos, right, um, of the world. Um, so it is uh, something which uh, is, is a new service which could be offered to them, I think. And, um, and that's something that we're interested in, but I think that for me, getting the technology going first is important because you have to go through a certification process um, for aviation. But, you know, it's part of the design process to go through that certification process, but I think it's a, a great opportunity. But I do think we have to think about things differently, so it doesn't make sense to only think about flying in big planes. And there's another reason for this. So when I fly myself, I don't have to go through security. I don't have to check my bag. I don't have to do anything. I just go, right? So there's a whole suite of general aviation airports that exist all over the United States, sort all over Europe too, that are underutilized. So you could actually use them for transportation. And it takes you usually closer to where you want to go if you live in the suburbs, for example. So um, there's a whole bunch of efficiencies from the you know, total time door to door last mile that you solve by going flying at a smaller airplane, flying at smaller airports versus going to you know, the international airport. So this is something that people don't think about because it's not the space that they're in, but it's an underutilized asset. And I believe you have them here in India as well. Um, and then the other advantage too, of course, is that um, not everybody in the world has access to nice long runways. Jet aircraft can only land on nice long runways. Many places in the world, they have dirt landing strips, right? They have grass fields. Smaller airplanes can land on all those. You're trained to land on them because the propeller doesn't really get affected as much by you know, grass and things like that. Whereas a jet engine, you pull in anything from dirt into it, the jet engine is toast, right? So ironically, we have an aviation system which has been driven around this one jet engine technology when in fact there are so many other solutions out there. So yeah, it's just, and, and I benefit from it because I can just get up and go to wherever I want to go because I have access to a bunch of smaller planes and I don't have to deal with the hassles of you know, going through security, <laughs> basically. So yeah, it's a different way of thinking and urban air mobility which I'm sure you've heard about and certainly people talk about like you know taking it, basically multi-rotor systems across town that's another example of this but there is inefficiency in having a multi-rotor system because you're not generating aerodynamic lift off the wings so you're a more efficient use of power if you land with a with a, a fixed wing aircraft basically so it's a better energy solution in that sense and some more questions back there <laughs> Yeah, uh, the question I have is that clearly this technology seems to be more, is more sustainable uh, as a fact. But uh, I'm curious that what is that uh, unsolved technological problem because of which this is not at the forefront of electrification or EVs, right? We see lithium ion battery uh, driven electric vehicles as the big wave, right? I'm assuming that is because this might be costlier or there is some unsolved problem which is still there. So I'm just curious what are those couple of problems that if solved could lead like you know a snowball effect into building hydrogen driven cars or vehicles. So the energy sector which I have not spent the majority of my career in right um, is incredibly political. Um, it's got entrenched interests so the reason why now we say oh but lithium ion batteries are a great solution. That's only because somebody came in and disrupted the market, which was Tesla. And he had enough money to do that because he was already an independently wealthy person. But for decades, uh, the oil and gas sector and the traditional automotive sector kept any other technologies out. So usually it isn't because the technology isn't ready, it's because whoever the interest, interest is, is not ready to lose their control. So that is a truthful answer to it. That being said, the battery solution is an easy, a really good one for a smaller vehicle, but it doesn't solve the problem for larger vehicles, which means you have to innovate again. Anytime you develop a new um, energy technology, you also need the energy infrastructure. So I would say the largest hurdle for hydrogen is the infrastructure, but that's where automotive is a more difficult solution 
pollution, because if you have a car, you need to be able to fuel it like in a couple of minutes from your house, right? Because I deal with this problem all the time. Like, so it's like, I need to go, fortunately I have three fueling stations within 15 minutes of my house because that's the way Southern California is. But if you didn't have that option then, and you didn't have an infrastructure, then you wouldn't be able to own that vehicle. So automotive is the most difficult infrastructure problem because you need a lot more of them. Aviation is an easier one because there's fewer airports. But in terms of, um, Technology relation um, for aviation, Ch the storage of, uh, there is a, a challenge associated with storing it, right? So for an aircraft, you can't store it as a high pressure gas because aircraft have incredibly um, tight weight limitations. For a car, you can store it as a high pressure gas, but when you look at the mass fraction of those tanks, for a high pressure gas tank, you're only getting 6% of that mass as fuel. The rest of the 94% is tank. So if you go with liquid hydrogen tanks, you can get 70% you know, mass fraction. So even that is not an engineering challenge. Liquid hydrogen tanks are nothing new. They're used all the time, but there isn't one that's currently made for an aircraft, so we're developing that. But once again, it, the technology isn't any different. It's just a manufacturing for a different marketplace. So in reality, none of this technology um, is insurmountable. None of it requires an obtainium. No, none of it requires the development of even new materials, but it does require an engineering development to put it all together. And that's what engineering is. Science is developing the new material. Engineering is developing the new product with all these different scientific discoveries. And so that just really needs to happen in these different use cases. That being said, it's not just the fuel cell. It's the balance of plant technology. So as you go to larger vehicles, you need bigger electric motors. If there isn't a demand for a 500 kilowatt electric motor out there, somebody has to develop it, but that's the opportunity. And I would say over the course of the past four years, even during the pandemic, there have been so many more companies that have started up in the high temperature magnet space, in the electric motor space that didn't exist before because they're now seeing the potential of this new ecosystem to create these new products that don't exist. So that's why this is kind of like, you know, the space program is also this way. This is a new growth opportunity, a new sector, and it's very rare that you have governments around the world aligning to support it. The only person who probably doesn't support it is Elon Musk, right? Because it puts at risk his business model, right? But that's one person, right? And it's okay, he should be interested in his own business interest, right? But it is a healthy debate to be had, and batteries absolutely have a place for smaller vehicles, but it is not a scalable solution. I go to battery mineral conferences, you will never produce enough lithium to match the demand of shifting all passenger cars over to a lithium ion battery. So it is not a scalable um, solution. So we have to find something else. And in general, my goal would be for all of us to not use, uh, have our own individual passenger cars. We need to use shared transport, so. Got it. Uh, just one, small, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that for this technology to be adopted, somebody needs to get behind it, and they have to have a lot of money or power. And if that happens, this will happen. Well, it, well they, they, that already exists, right? So Toyota is behind it, Hyundai is behind it, many companies in China are behind it. The people who aren't behind it, there's GM and Ford, and that's because they've already, oh no, they're already behind the game by putting battery powered cars, so they're not ready yet to do the fuel cell. So I think there are already big companies who are yeah. behind it. It's just that the passenger car marketplace is very different from the heavy duty marketplace. And um, the, guess what, the only technology which is being developed for trucking, for electric propulsion, is hydrogen fuel cell technology, because batteries don't work. So that's why there are niche markets for it where maybe passenger cars isn't the necessary one because you can solve it with batteries, but aviation, marine, and heavy duty vehicles is the marketplace. And when you have the entire United States Department of Energy behind it, that's a pretty good player to have behind yeah, it. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's more about um, sort of like education to the public, that it's an option, that it's real. And even the United States, like, I, this is the car that I drive back and forth, you know, every day to wherever I'm going, so for me it's already here, but because everybody else in the country outside of California doesn't have it, they still see it as, oh, it's still five to ten years out. It's not. It's already operational. It's just the infrastructure isn't there. And, you know, that's where California has done a fantastic job that as a state government, it chose to invest itself in putting the infrastructure in place. But California is also a massive economy, right? I think it's like the sixth largest economy in the world because the tech sector in the United States is in California. So it has the wherewithal to do it. And it's always been kind of on the forefront, whereas like the East Coast, New York is a little bit more, you know, older finance sector. So it's really a cultural mindset um, that more than anything else. It's not a technology limitation, in my opinion. But <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for a great talk. I had a follow-up sort of to your, uh, uh, what do you think about um, public policy as the driver for innovation? Because like you said, we need to move to shared 
transit, right? And uh, from what I've seen in my personal experience, what I've read is that by far the biggest change agent in mass transit is usually the government. To give you an example, the, the Delhi Metro is a great example of, say, uh, driving, uh, quickly delivering a framework for rapid transit and, and last mile connectivity. Um, what do you think is the, uh, I guess, the, the hitch in, in making the jump from, uh, from breakthrough technology to having public policy adopted as, say, the framework for, for implementation? It's a difficult one because there are so many entrenched interests, right? Because for me to say, like if I was at a, uh, the LA Auto Show and I said, I think we should get rid of passenger cars, I'd like, be, they'd be throwing tomatoes at me, right? So there's a lot of, or maybe something worse, uh, but there's a lot of entrenched interests out there that don't want it to happen tomorrow. And I'm not the best on the political front, so I'm just more interested in pushing the technology. But I think there has to be an incentivized structure, right, which incentivizes people to adopt the technology, which then lets the car companies make money, lets the infrastructure companies make money, also decarbon. So I think I don't like the uh, the punitive policy that kind of like the Europeans do the punitive measure. I don't think that really works. So I think the incentivized structure works. But the incentivized structure has to go also for using public transport. Because in the United States, I would say in California and maybe in India, there's some sort of like stigma associated with using public transport, right? So you got to get rid of that stigma too. And so Europe doesn't have that stigma, which is why everybody uses public transport. But that, um, that cultural stigma, which is actually driven by the interest that I want everybody to own a passenger car, right? So people People need to be honest about that. Um, governments need to align policies to incentivize people to make these decisions. And I would argue, for any of you who've personally experienced, you know, problems associated with climate change or health issues associated with the, you know, qual air quality. I mean, it is something that we have to do. We don't have a choice. And the irony is, the one thing that we don't have to worry about is the financial impact because the financial impact will be positive if we shift over to it. I truly believe this, and we've seen it in California, right? Because people have shifted already, and California is a very wealthy state, and it keeps on getting wealthier because it's making these forward-thinking decisions. So it is a, it is a cultural um, uh, sort of the way things are mentality that almost holds everything back. But yeah, and I think as individuals, we could support you know, people who push these kinds of agendas, we can adopt these things in our personal lives, right? Those are, and as companies, right? As business leaders, as business owners, we absolutely should push these things too, right? So give incentives to your employees to use public transportation, to ride their bicycle, right? To make these types of purchases. Like in California, and I will be honest with you, this is amazing, the incentive structure for buying these cars is you don't pay for gas for five years, right? So right now when the price of fuel is like through the roof, not for hydrogen, right? But you don't pay for gas, right? So when your cost of ownership becomes less, of course you're going to do it. So the positive reinforcement, I think, works way better than the negative reinforcement. And then I think, then everybody starts to kind of buy into that system. But I'm also an optimist, so <laughs> that's part of it. Oh, I think we're all right. It. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.